event. Um, I want to thank my wife, Santa. Uh, Santa. <laughs> Santa and I have spent 25 years exploring the most intriguing and mysterious archaeological sites in, in the world. Uh, we've been at the bottom of the ocean together many times and at the top of the Great Pyramid five times, three times illegally. And uh, <laughs> um, I... I I wouldn't be able to do anything I do if it wasn't for Santa. Santa's a photographer. It's her photographs that illustrate my books. It's her photographs that illustrate the presentations. Um, but most important, uh, I don't think I would ever have become uh, a, a writer or, or lived the life I've lived if it hadn't been for Santa by my side. She's kept me on the straight and narrow many times and stopped me from falling into the abyss. So thank you, Santa. Um, I also want to thank the people of Colorado <laughs> for, for, for doing a great thing, for proving th that the, that evil and wicked enterprise called the war on drugs is a complete useless sham. For, 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 for proving that the emperor of the war on drugs wears no clothes. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. You're setting an example all over the world that's going to be followed and it's going to change everything. And fundamentally, it's not about getting high. It's about the right of adults to make sovereign decisions over their own consciousness. Thank you. So, uh, I had three years off cannabis between 2011 and 2014, complete abstinence. Then Joe Rogan smoked me up last September. <laughs> And uh, I kind of lapsed a bit since then. I'm, enjo I'm, I'm enjoying the herb again, but I like to think I have a much more positive relationship with it. It's not something that I do all day, every day, um, but uh, I, it's, it's playing a significant and important part of my life, in my life. So first thing I did when I got off the plane last night was drive to a district called Edgewater, I think, where, where there are late-night dispensaries, and I got myself the Mile High Mint. Um, <laughs> A little bit of which is still with me today as I speak, but there we go. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Colorado. It's really important what's happening here, and it's setting, it's setting a standard and an example for the rest of the world, and it's going to be a better world if we all go down this route. Okay, so that's the question. Could we have lost uh, a whole civilization in the night of time, in the, in the depths of the last ice age, thousands of years before the first civilizations arose? Could there be some reality behind the myths of a former golden age and of a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity? Well, anatomically modern humans, creatures like you and I, uh, we can say for sure have been on this planet for at least 200,000 years. It's possible that anatomically modern humans have been on the planet for a lot longer than that, and we just haven't found their remains. But for sure we can say 200,000 years. The anatomically modern body, the anatomically modern brain. So the question is, why did we wait 195,000 years to form the first civilizations? Or is it possible that civilization, as we understand it, was created earlier, uh, and that we lost track of that, uh, that we lost, that we lost uh, an episode of the human story. Um, <laughs> archaeologists and historians like to present a, a timeline which in a sense is quite ideological because it, it depicts us as the apex and the pinnacle of the human story. Uh, that, that as though the whole story of humanity has been about us, has been directed towards us and moving towards us. Uh, that it's been a long, steady um, evolutionary progress from Stone Age cavemen through the first agriculture, the Neolithic, uh, megalithic sites beginning to appear about five, five and a half thousand years old ago, the first cities, and then onwards from there uh, into increasing technology and specialization until here we are is sitting at the top of the, 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 the whole chain. Um, most of this, most of what they say for the last 9,000 years or so is pretty well argued and fairly solid. But there's a problem with the House of History. And the problem with the House of History, I've indicated with this little star here, 
It's the very recent discovery of an extinction-level cataclysmic event that affected the entire Earth between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And that is right in the foundations of the time when historians and archaeologists say that we began to develop the first civilizations. Without uh, presenting the model of the development of civilization without taking this extinction level event into account uh, raises the possibility that everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization could be wrong because that event was big enough uh, to wipe out all traces of an earlier civilization. And maybe the first signs that what are taken of as the first signs of civilization, maybe they're a restarting of civilization rather than something completely new. Um, so why am I showing you images of dinosaurs, chickens, and shrews? Well, something really bad happened to the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, and that very bad thing made the dinosaurs extinct. Uh, if there are any survivors of the dinosaurs, it's a kind of devolution Perhaps chickens are giant. Whatever it was, it turned simplistically dinosaurs into chickens. At the same time, there was this little mammal like creature, like a shrew, which was skulking around in the forests going nowhere. And once the dinosaurs had been cleared out of the way, that shrew like creature began to evolve and take its place. And eventually, uh, that became us. So, you know, meet your 65 million year old mother. The extinction-level event that, that wiped the dinosaurs for, from the planet was a world-changing event. It changed the whole story. One story stopped completely, and a new story started. And this is a common feature in extinction-level events. Uh, these astonished-looking dinosaurs are gazing at the end of their world. Uh, coming whizzing in from outer space is a, a huge chunk of rock. And that chunk of rock is about six miles wide, and it's coming in at something like 70,000 miles an hour. And it is going to cause a global firestorm and horrendous cataclysmic events on Earth, and the dinosaurs will not survive that event. Um, it's understood now what the cause of this was, that it was a space rock. Uh, and, and generally speaking, it's thought to be an asteroid, although there's quite a lot of science which suggests that it might have been a comet. It was first observed. First of all, what was observed was the sudden extinction of the dinosaurs. Secondly, uh, a, team of, a, a team of scientists um, called Luis and Walter Alvarez uh, began to look around the world in the layer of soil dating from that period, and they found a distinct boundary layer, which is called the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary from 65 million years ago, and that is full of ash and soot, and it's full of objects which are only produced by massive cosmic impacts, uh, iridium, uh, impact spherules, nanodiamonds, melt glass, uh, minerals such as suicide that had been melted at temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade, which is the boiling point of quartz. These are all impact proxies. They are, they are the kind of things that are only produced with the massive shock and heat of a large cosmic impact. Uh, but initially, when Lewis and Walter Alvarez presented this idea that the dinosaurs had been made extinct by a, a massive cosmic impact, uh, they were ridiculed by their colleagues, and, and they were subjected to the best part of a decade of ferocious attacks, not only on their ideas, but also upon their persons, because the suggestion that they were making uh, goes against one of the fundamental dogmas of, of geology, which is called uniformitarianism, that things should that the way the world works now can be taken as a guide for how the world has worked in the past. And since we don't see extinction-level events today, it seemed improbable that a cosmic impact had caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, even though that, that layer in the soil with the impact proxies are absolutely unmistakable signatures of an impact. Eventually, Lewis and Walter Alvarez found the final answer to their critics. They found the crater, a giant crater, partly beneath the Gulf of Mexico, partly across the Yucatan. And that really silenced the criticisms. And since then, it's been accepted universally that it was a cosmic impact that wiped the dinosaurs out. Now, NASA has taken all of this into account, and NASA accepts that extinction-level events do occur on this planet. But NASA wants to reassure us that 
they only occur once every 100 million years. How nice of the universe to be so Germanic in its timing that we can count on these 100 million year intervals between extinction level events. And as a matter of fact, quite a number of scientists disagree with NASA's comfortable position on this. And they include the late Sir Fred Hoyle, who was professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, Chandra Wickram Singh, Victor Klub, uh, and Bill Napier. Uh, they're warning that our cosmic environment environment may be much more active than NASA teaches, and, and their concern particularly is with comets. And they point out that there's an ancient worldwide uh, fear of comets. It's found in every culture. Comets are not welcome visitors to the ancient skies. They're taken as a sign of disaster, uh, of impending doom. And their suggestion is that for this to be universally distributed around the world must have some basis in, in memory. There must be something planted in our minds, in our psyche, that remembers that comets are really bad news. Uh, here's a NASA fact sheet telling us what meteor showers are. Uh, and they're rightly saying that all meteor showers are in fact the debris stream left behind by former comets. Comets that have broken up into multiple parts, the parts have banged against one another, they've broken into smaller parts, and you eventually, along the track of the original orbit of the comet, you get spread out a large trail of debris. And that's what a meteor shower is. And NASA says, of course, we pass through lots of meteor showers every year. But NASA says, don't worry about this. The meteoroids are usually small, dust particle to boulder size, usually burn up in the atmosphere. So we're just going to get some nice uh, light shows and not much more than that. Not all the ast astronomers share this view. The team whose images I showed you a moment ago, Victor Klub, Bill Napier and their colleagues, focus particularly on the torrid meteor stream. It's called the torrid meteor stream because it appears to emanate from the region of the sky in which the constellation of Taurus is found. It doesn't mean it's coming from the millions of light years distance co constellation of Taurus, but it means it's coming from that area of the sky. That's what, it, that's what it looks like. And in fact, we pass through the torrid meteor stream twice a year. We've just been through it. Uh, in, in November, you get about 12 days of Halloween fireworks at the beginning of November. That's passage through the torrid meteor stream. And we also pass through it at the end of June. Uh, when we pass through it in June, we don't see meteors because they're coming in from the sun side of the Earth. Um, but they're there. And as a matter of fact, the most recent documented substantial impact from the torrid meteor stream was on the 30th of June, 1908. And it's the so-called Tunguska event that took place in Russia over, fortunately, an uninhabited area of Siberia. In this case, we're dealing with quite a small object, uh, which was certainly less than 200 meters in diameter and, and certainly not, 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 not somewhere between 60 meters and, and 190 meters in diameter. It didn't even hit the ground. It actually exploded in the air. It was an air burst. It exploded about five kilometers above the ground. But it flattened 80 million trees across 2,000 square kilometers, an area the size of the city of London. Fortunately, it was an uninhabited area. Uh, if this event had taken place over a major center of urban population, we would all be very concerned about the torrid meteor stream today because an entire city would have been, would have been wiped out. Uh, this graphic shows the torrid meteor stream and it shows our passage through it twice a year in June and in November. The torrid meteor stream is the remnant of a giant comet, a comet that was once 100 kilometers, about 60 miles in diameter, that is believed to have entered the solar system about 20,000 years ago, uh, that underwent fragmentation, as comets do, um, and, and uh, spread out along the trail of the comet. And it's a huge trail that's left. It's 30 million kilometers wide. And the Earth travels at two and a half million kilometers a day on its orbital path. And that's why it takes us 12 days twice a year to pass through the torrid meteor stream. Um, and the problem is that 
Yes, there are a number of recognized large objects in there, such as Comet Enki, which is a substantial fragment of the original comet, uh, Olgiato Rudniki, 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects. There's lots of small stuff in there as well. But the evidence that some of the big stuff in the Torrid meteor stream has interacted with the Earth during the historical period is what we're going to go into now. Um, Comet Shoemaker Levy 9, which hit Jupiter in 1994, uh, gave us all, all an idea of the power of comets and also of their characteristic behavior, which is to break up into multiple fragments. Actually, Shoemaker Levy 9 was quite a small comet. It was only about two kilometers in diameter. It broke up into 20 fragments, and these 20 fragments pounded into the, the planet Jupiter with uh, colossal explosive power. Um, as a matter of fact, the total explosive power of the shoemaker levy 9 impacts was 300 gigatons. And a gigaton is equivalent to 1 billion tons of TNT. Uh, for comparison, the stockpiled nuclear arsenal of the entire Earth, were it to explode at once, would be equivalent to just 6.4 gigatons. So we are dealing with massive power here. And this is the moment to say, thank you, Jupiter. <laughs> thank you, Jupiter. And thank you, Saturn, too. Because these huge gas giants circulating in the outer solar system actually draw in most of the impactors that would have sterilized the Earth long ago. There would be no life on this planet if we were not guarded by these huge planets with their enormous gravity. So Jupiter again and again takes one for the team. <laughs> but every now and then, comets do get through. And the evidence is that the comet, the original progenitor comet of the Torrid meteor stream, got through about 20,000 years ago. Here's Bill Napier writing in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in July 2010. The evidence, decades old now, and not even controversial amongst the comet community, is that an exceptionally large, low-inclination, short-period comet has been orbiting in our neighborhood for about 20,000 years. In such a disintegrating environment, there is a reasonable probability of a catastrophic encounter with debris in the comet trail. And he is connecting the dots. He and the team of astronomers he work, works with were looking at the sky. But meanwhile, another team of scientists, Earth scientists, were looking at the ground. And for a long time, these two teams were not comparing notes. This is the first paper in which they do compare notes because the other team have presented the evidence of a massive comet impact on planet Earth just 12,800 years ago, accompanied by global animal extinctions. And in this paper, Bill Napier is joining the dots and, and making it clear that he, he and his colleagues and the Earth scientists have both been working on the same problem. The Earth scientists looking at the ground, getting the evidence from the ground, the astronomers from the sky, but they're dealing with the same comet. Uh, the Earth scientist team include James Kennett, who's a marine geologist, professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a world-renowned expert in paleo-oceanography. Richard si Firestone is a staff scientist at the Nuclear Science D Division, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. James Whitker is a geologist. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist. Actually, there's more than 30 of them. And they first began to publish their findings in the peer-reviewed press in 2007. Um, this information has remained largely confined to scientific journals and very little, apart from a few headlines, has got out into the public domain. And one of the things I've done in Magicians of the Gods is to try to present that information in a, in a coherent and readable way. Um, to understand why these scientists got interested in the possibility of a comet impact, it's important to understand how the world was during the last ice age. The last glacial maximum was reached 21,300 years ago. At that time, there were gigantic ice caps about three miles deep sitting on top of the northern half of North America and the northern half of northern Europe and other areas as well. What this meant was that sea level was much lower. It was 400 feet lower than it is today because all that water was locked up in ice on the ice caps. So as a result, there was no Red Sea, there was no Persian Gulf. Indonesia was this giant continent instead of a group of islands, a very different world. 10 million square miles of land that were above water then are underwater now. After 21,300 years ago, the world began to warm up, and it did so in quite a polite, gradual way. 
until suddenly, 12,800 years ago, there was a huge, dramatic plunge in temperature, taking the world back to the coldest that it had been at, at, at the coldest point of the Ice Age. And that plunge in temperature, which was accompanied by animal extinctions right across the world, lasted for 1,200 years until 11,600 years ago, at which time temperatures equally mysteriously, equally suddenly shot up again. And these scientists wanted to find out what, have, what could have caused this, what could have caused this episode which is known by ge to, to geologists as the Younger Dryas, this 1,200 years of hell between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And interestingly, the whole story of human civilization as it's taught to us supposedly unfolds in the period immediately, begins to unfold in the period immediately after the Younger Dryas. Obviously, we need to know what was going on in the Younger Dryas. Uh, and why was it accompanied by these enormous animal extinctions? Well, this is um, a problem that affected the entire Earth, but the epicenter was in North America. North America was the heart of this cataclysm, and the animal extinctions were at the, their most extreme here. Um, Lo and behold, it turns out that exactly at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, there is a boundary layer in the soil, pretty much identical to the boundary layer found in the Cretaceous tertiary boundary when the dinosaurs were made extinct. The same indicators are there, all the same impact proxies, the nano diamonds, evidence for temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees centigrade, the melt glass, the carbon spherules, uh, and so on and so forth, and a layer of soot and ash. Um, there's only two places that you find all of this in a layer of soil. One is 65 million years ago when it's accompanied by massive extinctions and the other is 12,800 years ago accompanied by massive extinctions. I don't expect you to read these academic papers. I'm just putting them up there to make my point that we're dealing with substantial mainstream science here. This is not fringe stuff. This is stuff that has been through a rigorous peer review process. And I report that also in the book. And I report the criticisms of their work and the way that those criticisms have been refuted. Here's the first paper. At that time, they were giving a date of 12,900 years ago. They've refined it down to 12,800 in the last couple of years. This paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. Evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the young dry ass cooling. Here's a paper from 2009, shock synthesized hexagonal diamonds in younger dry ass boundary sediments. And here a whole raft of papers, very high temperature melt products as evidence for cosmic air bursts and impacts 12,900 years ago. Um, evidence from Mexico, evidence from the Greenland ice cores, evidence for deposition of 10 million tons of impact spherules across four continents 12,800 years ago. Here's the Journal of Geology, 5th of September 2014. Nano diamond rich layer across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact at 12,800 years ago. And the latest paper is what's called a Bayesian uh, chronological uh, analysis. It's a horrible word even to pronounce. But, <laughs> but basically, it's a statistical study, study of the sites from which the evidence has been produced. Was this evidence laid down in 100 or, or 200 years, or was it very sudden? The statistical study shows that what happened 12,800 years ago was an isochron. It happened in a single instant, effectively one single afternoon, across 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface, because that is the area that was profoundly affected by the Younger Dryas impact. The primary impacts were on the North American ice cap, and the ice was still two miles deep 12,800 years ago. Uh, there were further impacts on the Northern European ice cap, there were impacts in South America, and the furthest east they've tracked it is Syria. Where's the crater? The same criticism that was leveled at the Alvarez team has also been leveled at the Younger Dryas impact team. Where's the crater? They made the point that the primary impacts were on the North American ice cap. When, a, when an impact hits ice that's two miles deep, you don't get a permanent crater. The crater's formed in ice, the ice melts away, and all that's left are shock effects on the ground. Those shock effects are beginning to be identified, but just in the last couple of years, beyond the edge of the former ice cap, 
we are also finding absolute evidence of craters dating to this period. And they include, include the Corosol Crater, uh, the Bloody Street Creek structure, the, the Charity Shoal feature, and the Qu Qu Quebecia terrain. So this case now is a very firm and very solid one. I'm not saying that the arguments are over. They're not. Arguments in science go on for a long time. Uh, but these guys have made a, an incredibly strong persuasive case, and the evidence is absolutely massive. Uh, and I think it needs to be taken extremely seriously. So in summary, 12,800 years ago, multiple fragments of a giant comet impacted the Earth. Some of the fragments m may have arranged more than a kilometer in diameter. Impacts were concentrated on the North American ice cap, but the resulting climate disaster was worldwide. Why did it get so cold suddenly at the beginning of the Younger Dryas? The answer is the impacts on the North American ice cap. They instantly liquidize large areas of the ice cap and a flood of icy water pours into the Atlantic Ocean where it interrupts the Gulf Stream, which is part of the global meridional overturning circulation of our planet. The central heating system of our planet is broken and that's why the Earth gets suddenly dramatically cold. At the same time, that flood water doesn't only go into the Atlantic Ocean, it also runs south across the North American continent. Uh, and I made a, a huge journey last year with uh, Randall Carlson uh, looking at the evidence for this on the ground. Now, nobody actually disputes that the channeled scablands of the Pacific Northwest of the United States were shaped by immense floods uh, around 12,800 years ago. And it is recognized that these floods are slightly anomalous because this was a time of a sudden freeze, whereas you would expect to see flooding when things are getting warmer and the ice caps are, are melting. Uh, the first scholar to identify the tracks of the floods in the Pacific Northwest was a great American geologist called J. Harlan Bretz. He was quite a cranky guy, actually. Um, and... <laughs> The J was his first name, so he used to get furious with proofreaders when they insisted on putting a full point after it. Uh, he was a, a classic boots-on-the-ground field geologist. He walked the walk across the Pacific Northwest, and everywhere he went, he saw evidence for what he finally decided, putting it all together, had been one single gigantic flood, which had risen and fallen within two weeks, causing catastrophic damage on the ground. To suggest such a thing in the 1920s, which was when J. Harlan Brett suggested it, was tantamount to an act of heresy in the world of geology at the time. He was taken as, as somebody who was harking back to the days of the flood of Noah and to superstitions of that kind. It was considered to be anti-scientific to suggest that there had been a huge flood. And J. Harlan Bretz was pilloried, he was attacked, he was isolated, he went through an episode of intense depression, but he soldier, soldered on. And, and the, the critics were saying, well, well, what's the source of this flood water? How you say there's huge floods, but what's, what's the source? And, and he said, well, actually, that's not my problem. Uh, I can tell you from the evidence on the ground that there has been a flood. We'll figure out what the source of it was, but that wasn't good enough for them. Of course, he was right. Uh, and eventually, he was proved to be right. And in 1979, after spending half his life as a geological pariah, Bretz was awarded the Penrose Medal of the Geological Society of America, the most prestigious award in the field of ge geology. He was 96 years old at the time. And after receiving the award, he reportedly told his son, all my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over. <laughs> <laughs> now... Bretz had to accept a compromise to get his theory accepted. He was never comfortable with that compromise. And that compromise is called Glacial Lake Missoula. And this is the argument that you will find in all the, um, the, 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 the literature now. You will find that the flooding in the Pacific Northwest was caused by outburst floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. Not one, but multiple, maybe as many as 80 of them. And in this way, the cataclysmic ev evidence on the ground was provided with a gradualist source. If you have 80 floods over 2,000 years, that isn't a single dramatic cataclysm. That's a, it fitted in with the geology, with the ideology of the time. However, I think if Bretz had lived to see the evidence that the North American ice cap was hit 
12,800 years ago by several large fragments of the Younger Dryas comet, he would have abandoned Glacial Lake Missoula completely uh, because the comet provides the hither hitherto missing heat source to account for the sudden melting of a sufficiently vast area of the ice cap. And some of the landscape uh, features that originally convinced Bretts that there had been a single humongous flood have always been difficult to account for by the multiple floods from Gla uh, Glacial Lake Missoula model. We're looking down on dry falls, a fossilized waterfall between Upper and Lower Grand Coulee in Washington State. Um, and there I'm with Randall Carlson at the foot of just one lobe of that fossilized waterfall. Uh, and here we are overlooking it. Uh, and that's again just one lobe of a waterfall that continues all the way around here, a waterfall that was created in just two weeks. Okay, now to get the scale right, let's put Niagara Falls into the picture. Niagara Falls is just tiny by comparison with Dry Falls, but Niagara Falls is the result of 12,000 years of work of the river. Uh, this falls was the result of a flood that rose and fell within two weeks, a flood of unimaginable scale, a flood uh, full of forests that had been ripped up by their roots, uh, full of boulders and, and rubble and mud, uh, huge icebergs jostling against one another in the flood. It's a highly erosive agent, and it cuts upper and lower Grand Coulee, and it creates this now fossilized waterfall. Up above the town of uh, Wenatchee in uh, Washington state, sitting 500 feet above the valley floor, uh, on a hillside is a glacial erratic. This boulder does not belong here. It came from about 100 miles away. How did it get there? Let's have a, a, another look at it. There, are, there I am with Randall Carlson in front of it. Uh, there I am on top of it for scale. Uh, this boulder has been calculated to weigh 18,000 tons. It got there in an iceberg the size of an oil tanker one of thousands of icebergs that were carried from the disintegrating ice cap down in the flood that scarred the land in the Pacific Northwest. And you can see thousands of these 10 to, 10 to uh, 20,000 ton boulders uh, scattered all over the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it really, once you get it into your head what this is, every one of these was an iceberg, a huge iceberg, and they grounded and the flood subsided and then the icebergs melted away and left these enormous rocks that they'd enchained and snatched up. You begin to get a sense of the power of the events that scarred this landscape. This is the Camas Prairie. Um, it has ripples in the bottom of the prairie. Those ripples are a fractal, enlarged version of the kind of ripples that you get on a beach uh, when the tide goes out. Uh, you get these little ripples about two inches high and a few feet long. In this case, they're 50 feet high and hundreds of feet long, and they were caused by the receding floodwaters. Um, and the, these are the scablands from the air, so-called scablands, because the flood that poured over them literally plucked and tore the ground and left it in this devastated state that can still be witnessed today. Uh, it's not only the Pacific Northwest. Um, again, I go into this in, book, in the book. There's only time to cover a few small details tonight. Uh, the St. Croix River uh, in Minnesota is interesting. Huge glacial potholes there that were created by rocks circling in the current and cutting the, the potholes out. Uh, and the Finger Lakes of New York State, long thought to have been caused by glaciers, it looks more and more certain that they were also caused by this flooding 12,800 years ago. What happened at the end of the Younger Dryas? Why did things suddenly get warmer then? Why did temperatures shoot up? Uh, the science on this is not as good and not as complete as what happened at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. The scientists have been focusing on the 12,800 year ago event. But way back in the 1980s, Sir Fred Hoyle, professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, was also intrigued by the Younger Dryas and intrigued by that temperature spike at the end of the Younger Dryas. Uh, and he proposed a solution that comet fragments hitting an ocean would, first of all, have created global flooding and a global tidal wave, and secondly, would have thrown a huge amount of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, which would have enshrouded the Earth, creating a greenhouse effect and causing that warming spike. Um, it's a good suggestion. 
I think it's worth looking further into this and more science will be done on this. But what is clear is, what is sure is that the Younger Dryas did end abruptly 11,600 years ago. Global temperatures soared and the remaining ice caps very rapidly collapsed into the sea, causing a dramatic pulse of sea level rise. That dramatic pulse of sea level rise dated to 11,600 years ago is widely recognized by geologists. It's called meltwater pulse 1b. Interestingly enough, 11,600 years ago is also the date that Plato gives for the destruction and submergence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. Now, Atlantis is one of those things that archaeologists scoff at. They make fun of and mock uh, Atlantologists who are considered to be such lowly creatures as pyramidiots as well. Um, but the new evidence, I think, is going to require us to take Plato much more seriously. Uh, Plato tells us a number of things about Atlantis. First of all, where did he get the story? He got it through his family line from his ancestor Solon, the Greek lawmaker, who had visited Egypt around the year 600 BC. And there Solon was told the story of Atlantis by the priests of the Temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta, a temple that no longer exists apart from a few tumbled stones. Um, and they pointed to inscriptions on the walls of the temple where they said the story of Atlantis was set out. Um, and they said that this had happened 9,000 years before. So 9,000 years before 600 BC is 9,600 BC, which is 11,600 years ago, which is the end of the Younger Dryas and which is Meltwater Pulse 1b. So suddenly the notion of a, an island civilization that is submerged beneath the sea very suddenly 11,600 years ago doesn't seem like a fantasy. It fits exactly with the latest scientific uh, information. Pra Plato precedes the story with an account of um, cosmic events, of thunderbolts, from the sky, um, and he tells us that after the destruction of Atlantis, mankind had to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. So one other thing he tells us is the character of the civilization of Atlantis, that it was once a great and beautiful civilization, generous, kind, devoted to the nurturing of spirit, but that it became arrogant and cruel as time went by, and it began to project its power around the world, and it ceased to wear its prosperity with moderation. Um, and this is one of the reasons he suggests that the universe slapped Atlantis down. Now, Egyptologists will tell you there is no reference to Atlantis in any ancient Egyptian text. And that's true. There is, you cannot find the word Atlantis in any ancient Egyptian text. But you can certainly find a description of a sacred island which is destroyed in a cosmic accident, which is submerged beneath the waves, and which leaves a few survivors who then set about trying to restart civilization. And that story is told in great detail on the walls of this temple, which is the Temple of Horus at Edfu in Upper Egypt. It's not a very old temple. It dates to about 300 B.C., However, it inherited the archives of previous temples that had stood on that site, going back into the pre-dynastic period. And those archives included material written on animal skins, which was falling apart, and those priests took it upon themselves to preserve some of it by copying extracts onto the walls of this newly built temple. And those so-called Edfu building texts are found between the inner and outer enclosure walls. Uh, this is what they look like. Uh, and the story that they tell is of the island homeland of the primeval ones that was destroyed in a great flood. And they tell how the primeval ones, the gods, came to Egypt and established religion by building primeval mounds up and down the land. Those primeval mounds were to be the site of all future temples and pyramids to be built in Egypt. In other words, a blueprint was laid down in this remote period that is referred to in the Egyptian texts as Zep Tepi, the first time a blueprint was laid down that was to be followed thereafter throughout the history of Egypt. Uh, a snake called the Great Leaping One is described as the chief enemy of the god. Comets are often referred to as snakes or serpents in mythology. Uh, his assault causes the homeland of the primeval ones to be swallowed up by the sea, but first the island was pierced and the domain was split. 
the Edfu texts leave us in no doubt that there were survivors, uh, that the inhabitants of this island of the gods were navigators, they were seafarers, and some of them were far away at sea when the island was destroyed. They returned to the site of their island and they found it utterly gone and the sea completely filled with mud where it had stood. Almost exactly the same words are found in Plato's texts. He says, after Atlantis went down, the sea was so filled with mud that it was impossible to navigate through it in that, in that area. These survivors then set about wandering the world. They use a specific word for it in the ancient Egyptian texts. They wandered the world, and their project was to reconstitute or resurrect their lost former civilization. And it's a project that they pursued not only in Egypt, but in many other lands. So here's, again, one of those interesting facts. That 11,600-year-ago date is now being cited by archaeologists as the date for, quote, the invention of megalithic agriculture, sorry, megalithic architecture and agriculture at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Gobekli Tepe is a megalithic site that is rewriting history, and archaeologists are scrambling to catch up with the information revealed there. Now, Gobekli Tepe is in southeastern Turkey, in Anatolia, close to the Syrian border, and this is what it looks like. And it's a series of huge megalithic circles on the scale of Stonehenge, but 50 times larger and 7,000 years older than Stonehenge, because Gobekli Tepe dates back to 11,600 years ago. So the present fairy tale that archaeologists are telling about Gobekli Tepe is that a group of hunter-gatherers in that region uh, woke up inspired one morning to create the largest megalithic site that the world had ever seen. And even though they had no prior experience of organizing large labor forces or of cutting and quarrying stone and erecting megaliths weighing between 50 and 20 tons, no problem. They just acquired those experiences overnight with no background and they made Gobekli Tepe. And just on the side, they invented agriculture as well. This doesn't work for me. I think rather than a sudden, mysteriously precocious invention 7,000 years ahead of its time, what we're looking at here is obviously a transfer of technology, that people settled in that area who already knew how to make megaliths, who already knew what was needed for agriculture, and they shared those skills with the hunter-gatherers who had, they had settled amongst. Remember, today we live on a planet where there are there is an advanced civilization and there are hunter-gatherers. There are hunter-gatherers in the Amazon basin, hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert. I think it was the same in the Ice Age world uh, as well. So some of the megaliths do weigh 50 tons. This one was never taken out of the quarry. A fault was found in it, but you can see the classic T-shape there. Um, most of them are in the range of 20 tons. Uh, many are beautifully carved and astronomically aligned with high precision. Um, this one, I wish I had time to tell you more about it today. This is Pillar 43 in Enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe, but it's all in the book. Um, and here I am with Klaus Schmidt, uh, the discoverer and excavator of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, this was on a visit that I made there in 2013. Uh, unfortunately, Klaus Schmidt passed away in 2014. He died of a, of a massive heart attack in the summer of 2014. Uh, but he was generous to me on my visit there in 2013. He, he knew who I was. Most archaeologists, when I turn up on an archaeological site, act as though Dracula has appeared. <laughs> and scurry off and, and vanish from sight and won't speak to me. But, but Klaus Schmidt welcomed me. He, uh, I, I told him I wanted to learn about Gobekli Tepe. He said, okay, I'll show you around. And he actually spent three days showing me around and giving me the detail on Gobekli Tepe. What he's telling me here are two things. He's pointing vehemently at the ground because he's reminding me that only a one-fiftieth of the site has so far been excavated. That fiftieth is already the size of Stonehenge. The rest of the site, the other, you know, 49, the, 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 the other 50, 50th of the site is underground, still buried. Um, the the um, ground penetrating radar that's been taken over the, the site shows hundreds and hundreds and 
hundreds and hundreds of these huge megalithic pillars buried underneath the ground. They haven't even begun to excavate them yet. The second thing he's telling me is these Megalithic pillars were not buried by natural sedimentation. They were deliberately buried by whichever mysterious culture made this site and used it for a thousand years and then deliberately buried it and shut it down. So we must envisage gangs of people with buckets filled with earth and stones coming in and just pouring them over and filling up the, and burying the entire site like a time capsule. Actually, the name Gobekli Tepe means pot-bellied hill in the Turkish language. And the whole pot-bellied hill that sits over the top of this site is entirely artificial. So enormous effort was made to hide it, to disappear it from view. And after that was done, it wasn't touched again. It wasn't seen again by any anybody at all, until Klaus Schmidt found it in the second half of the 1990s, 10,000 years completely untouched. And that's why we can be sure of the dates of Gobekli Tepe, um, because the carbon datings that have come out of there, there's no possibility that later organic material has contaminated them and given falsely young datings. This is a sealed site, and its origin is 11,600 years old, and the best stuff is the very oldest at Gobekli Tepe. Wherever we find megalithic sites where we can be sure of the dating, they turn out to be older. This one's 130 feet down at the bottom of the Sicily Channel, published in September this year. Huge megalith, 36 feet high, um, part of a, a large complex of megaliths of stone circles. They've been underwater for more than 9,500 years. Therefore, they're at least 9,500 years old. We don't know how long they stood there before that, but Gobekli Tepe at last provides us with a context for mysterious findings like this. Um, and actually, if you look at the T-shaped megaliths of Gobekli Tepe and compare them with the T-shaped megaliths of Menorca, the Menorcan megaliths are only thought to be about 4,000 years old. I think we're going to have to revise the dating of the Menorcan me megaliths. And if we look at the general appearance of Gobekli Tepe, it's so similar to the huge megalithic temples of Malta. I think the dating of the megalithic temples of Malta is not sound either. Gobekli Tepe requires us to reconsider the dating of all megalithic sites around the world, including and very significantly the Great Sphinx of Giza. The Great Sphinx is a megalithic monument. It is cut entirely out of bedrock, and the limestone that was cut out around its flanks was then moved over and raised up into these megalithic temples. Egyptologists want us to believe that the Great Sphinx was made in 2500 BC, four and a half thousand years ago, by a specific pharaoh, the pharaoh Khafre of the fourth dynasty. And that is what is taught, as though there's no question mark over it in all our schools and universities. And that's what you'll find in any encyclopedia, that the Great Sphinx is the work of Khafre in 2500 BC. I've gone into the evidence for this in Magicians of the Gods. It's flimsy. There's nothing at all that Egyptology, Egyptology can bring forward that really places the Sphinx at 2500 BC. It's an ideological position, not a factual position. Back in 1992, my friends John Anthony West and Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, planted a kind of time bomb under the comfortable bottoms of Egyptologists. When they made the case that the Great Sphinx couldn't possibly date to 2500 BC, that it bears upon its flanks and upon the sides of the trench cut out around it, the unmistakable evidence of exposure to at least a thousand years of extremely heavy rainfall. And you do not get rainfall. We have not had rainfall of that kind in the Sahara Desert in the last 5,000 years. Giza was as dry 5,000 years ago as it is today. And you really have to go back to the Younger Dryas and to the prolonged rain out that occurred during the Younger Dryas to get the kind of weathering that we see on the Sphinx. Now, at the time, Egyptologists dismissed the case and they said, we know the Sphinx just dates to 2,500 BC. There's no possibility that it's older than that. And and my goodness, if there was a civilization in the world that was capable of creating the Sphinx 12,000 years ago, why we would find other evidence of that civilization, other megalithic sites around the world, and we don't. Well, they didn't in 1992. But the whole story is different in 2015. With Gobekli Tepe now on the horizon, we have to consider the possibility that the Sphinx is indeed 12,000 years old. Because if you can make Gobekli Tepe, you can make the Sphinx 
in, in every case, um, the, the historical argument is beginning to unravel. Here's a detail from a map drawn in 1489 um, and based on ancient source maps that are now lost. This Canepa map shows a huge river channel across the Sahara Desert and in West Africa. And we know that 11, 12,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert was fertile. A radar survey of Mauritania has recently revealed exactly the traces of that river channel that's been invisible for more than 5,000 years. What's it doing on a map drawn in 1489 from older source maps? Um, the answer is provided on the Piri Reis map, a map drawn in 1513 by a known figure, a Turkish admiral. Uh, and he tells us in his own handwriting on this map, this section of the map shows North America, South America, and West Africa. It was originally a world map, but the three quarters of the Piri Reis map has been lost. He tells us in his own handwriting on the map that it's based on more than 100 older source maps, which were falling apart, the contents of which he decided to preserve by copying them onto this new map. Um, and he tells us that he believes those source maps came from the lost library of Alexandria, that they were rescued before the fire that burnt the library of Alexandria down, and that they were taken out and brought to Constantinople, where he found them. Um, this map has been controversial for, for decades uh, because of the argument that it shows Antarctica at the southern tip of South America. But I'm interested in this island here up off North America, which is in the position of the Grand Bahama Banks. If we blow it up and look closely at it, we can see that a row of megaliths run up the middle of this island. And curiously enough, there is a row of megaliths in exactly that area. It's called the Bimini Road, and I've dived on it, but it's now underwater. We're going to have to go back about 10,000 years to get it above water, as it's shown on this map, 10,000 years or more. Here's uh, another map. This shows a little island off the coast, the west coast of Ireland. Uh, that island has not existed for 12,000 years. But if you can go back 12,000 years, you'll find that an island of exactly the right size in exactly the right shape stood in exactly the right place off the west coast of Ireland because sea levels were 400 feet lower then. It appears that somebody was mapping the world during the last ice age. Um, here's a modern map of Antarctica, and here's an honest map of Antarctica drawn in the year 1800. It shows nothing, just a gap where Antarctica is. It does so because it's an honest map, because our civilization hadn't discovered Antarctica in the year 1800. We didn't discover it until 1818. So we must explain why Antarctica appears on many ancient maps, which were drawn in the 14 and 1500s. This one is the Orontius Phineas map from 1531, and again, based on older source maps now lost. I think these maps bear testimony to a civilization that mapped the world during the last ice age and that did so with uncanny accuracy, uh, a lost civilization. Very near the end of the presentation I'm able to give tonight, this is Baalbek uh, in the Lebanon. Actually, it was friends in Denver who helped, helped us with our journey to, to Baalbek last year. Um, it's an amazing place, and I recommend anybody who gets the chance to do, to, do so to go to Baalbek. Um, there's a Roman temple there, a temple of Jupiter. Um, but there are also megalithic elements there, which are extremely interesting. Um, and I am standing here uh, on the south side of a U-shaped megalithic wall that runs around three sides of the platform of the temple of Jupiter, but nowhere touches it. It is completely separate from the platform of the Temple of Jupiter. Um, there I'm looking down on the north side of this megalithic wall, where the blocks weigh about 500 tons each. And now we're on the west side, and there are three blocks in the western wall, the Trilithon, where each of these blocks weighs 900 tons, and they are raised up to a height of 30 feet above the ground, and they are so perfectly positioned that you cannot even slip the edge of a piece of paper between the joints, 900 tons each. But if you want to hear, again, I'm just giving another view of it. Um, those are 
the three blocks there. I'm pointing up at the southern one and I'm sitting on it here. Uh, if you want to see the really big blocks, go to the quarry at Baalbek. Um, there, this one's referred to locally as the stone of the pregnant woman. Um, it's completely separated from the bedrock underneath. That's me on top of it for scale. Calculations put it, its weight at just over 1,000 tons. Across the road, on the other side of the quarry, now sadly being used as a rubbish tip, is another of these huge blocks. This one weighs 1,250 tons. And a third one, amazingly, the German Archaeological Institute has been excavating Baalbek for a century. But the third and largest of the megalithic blocks, this one, was only discovered last June. It was covered by sediment until then. And actually, I'm standing, I'm standing on it there. That's the front edge of it there. This third block calculated to weigh 1,460 tons, staggering weights. Now, the argument is, the argument that archaeologists make is that all of this, all of it was done by the Romans. The Romans built the Temple of Jupiter with relatively small blocks of stone. And they built the huge megalithic wall that stands separate from it but surrounds it on three sides. And what they say is that the Romans found that they were able to move the 900-ton blocks, but that after having cut and quarried these three much larger blocks, having gone to all the trouble of perfectly finishing them off in all their dimensions, they realized they couldn't move those. So they just left them and abandoned them in the quarry. This seems to me like a most un-Roman thing to do. <laughs> Let's imagine that the story's true and that they found they couldn't move the blocks. The Romans, if that were the case, would certainly not have abandoned them in the quarry. They would have sliced them up like loaves of bread into smaller blocks. After all, a lot of work had already been done on these blocks. They would slice them up into smaller blocks and use those smaller blocks in the construction of their temple. The fact that those blocks are still there in the quarry, and the only one, and one of them was only discovered last year, suggests to me very strongly that the whole area was unknown to the Romans, that the whole area was covered in sediment, and that we are dealing with an ancient prehistoric megalithic structure, and that the Romans built their temple where they did, within the embrace of that much more ancient U-shaped megalithic wall. Um, I don't have time tonight to go into other evidence. The, this in extraordinary stone circle, 120 feet underwater off Japan, the mysteries of Tiwanaku in the Andes, the sky ground correlations at Giza, the vast three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles of Sacsayhuaman in the, in the Andes, this site, Gunung Padang in Indonesia, which is just like Gobekli Tebi rewriting history. Again, all the information is in the book. I, I just am not allocated enough time to share it with you tonight. And these Easter Island statues, uh, which are buried beneath 30 feet of sedimentation, um, the suggestion is that they too are much older than is given uh, credit for. I document all of this in the book. The point is that we have an extinction level event between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago that has not yet been taken into account in any model of history presently being taught in our schools and universities. And this suggests to me that the house of history is built on foundations of sand. And we all know what happens when you build a house on foundations of sand. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So look, let's let's take a few a few questions. Again, time is limited tonight, and I have to I have to respect the the needs of the bookshop. So I'll take a few questions. Then afterwards, I will sit here. If anybody wants books signed and dedicated, I'm here for you. I will absolutely do that. If anybody should be so crazy as to want a photograph with me, something that happens, don't be shy. I'm absolutely up for that as well. I'm I'm here for you. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. First question. Yes. The one in Indonesia, yeah, it's called Gunung Padang. Yes, if I'd had more time tonight, I would, I would tell that story. Well, so you're asking about the status, the status of the excavations at Gunung Padang. 
what happened was they've gone through an up and down process. The excavations, the study has been carried out entirely by geologists. Danny Hillman Natwijaja is Indonesia's leading expert in megathrust earthquakes. He's a Caltech-trained geologist. He's not an archaeologist. And archaeologists in Indonesia took exception to he and his geological team studying this site. Uh, and they lobbied to have them thrown off the site. And they succeeded. Then Danny took the case to the president of Indonesia. The president of Indonesia came to the site and he said, this is ridiculous that you're being stopped working here. Get on with it. And gave a presidential decree that they should continue with the work. They assembled their team, got it all together by August 2014. They then had August, September and the first 10 days of October when they excavated. And then the presidency changed. And a new president came in, Joko Widodo. And he immediately stopped the excavations. And there was a, just not accidentally, just before that, there was a huge lobby from archaeologists demanding that the excavations be stopped. I think it's a case of sour grapes. The archaeologists are not happy that a non-archaeologist is doing some of the most important archaeological work in the world. And I, I have great faith in Danny. I know him very well. He's dynamic. He's not going to give up. We will see this excavation started again, hopefully this year. Yeah. Yes. Right, so the, I'm going to repeat the question so that others can hear. Would an impact like that have affected the orbit of the Earth? Um, I don't think so. I don't think, it, I don't think it would affect the Earth's orbit. What it would affect and what it would destabilize is the crust of the Earth. Uh, but the, the Earth's orbital path is, is so solidly grounded, I think you'd need a much bigger impactor. You'd need an impactor the size of the Moon to shift the Earth off its, off its orbit. And that was not the case here. Yeah. The angle of the Earth's axis, the obliquity of the ecliptic, uh, that undergoes a, a kind of nodding motion on its own over a, a cycle of about 41,000 years. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that that could slightly be altered by an impact. I wouldn't have thought massively by it. Yes. Yeah, just recently it's been found, a massive underground city with, with tunnels that go seven kilometers and, and join up with other underground cities. I, I do go into these underground cities in the in the book because they're really a, mis a mystery. You know, the argument is that they were created mm, perhaps 800 BC by a people called the Phrygians and have since then been elaborated and developed, but there's no real evidence for that. As is often the case with archaeology that involves stone structures. When a structure is made from solid stone, it's really hard to date it. There isn't an objective technique for dating it. Carbon dating only dates organic material. So you want organic material that's firmly associated with that structure and that you can then deduce the organic material is of the same age as the, that structure. And that's not the case in the underground cities because they've been, they have been used by repeated civilizations over long periods of time. I think they're much older. I think they do go back to this period. They're part of the same enterprise as Gobekli Tepe. And I'm reminded that that period between... 12,800 and 11,600 years ago was a period of sustained cataclysm. There are references in traditions in that area of that deep freeze, of the sudden freezing cold and of bombardments from the sky. And one place to go to get away from bombardments from the sky and freezing cold is under the ground. Well, the precession of the equinoxes is an effect that's caused by the precessional wobble on the axis of the Earth, which, which, un, which is a cycle that unfolds over 25,920 years at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Uh, so it, it changes the, the rising times of stars and the orientation of the star field. To observe it, here's roughly what you're going to do. You're going to hold up your finger to the horizon. And that one degree of processional change, which unfolds in 72 years, will be a change about the width of your finger against the horizon. To actually map it and document it, you're going to have to observe it and keep detailed records for hundreds and preferably for thousands of years until you can get it exactly right as to what's going on. And the evidence is that some mysterious ancient culture did make those observations deep in prehistory and, and made a great effort to pass that information down both in mythology and in monuments. The status on the chamber that's underneath of the Sphinx, the answer there is, ask Zahi Hawass. <laughs> uh, 
you know, because uh, I mean, this is another example of, of, you know, archaeology that paints itself as squeaky clean, actually being involved in some really ugly and unpleasant uh, matters and, and, and in secrecy. And the secret studies that have taken place at Giza, some hint of which have got out, some of which we, we do know about, um, have involved searches for that chamber. I think we know already that there's a chamber there. John West and Robert Schock did seismic work around the Sphinx in 1992 before they were kicked out and Zahi took over. Um, but we know that there's a chamber under the left forepaw of the Sphinx. I think it's already been entered, and, and for some reason the information is not, being, is not being shared with the public. I have to say that those who are running the Giza Plateau, I don't trust them an inch, not an inch. It's, we've had so little truth out of them. What I, what, I see, what I see all around the world is evidence for a remote common origin of a system of ideas that subsequently began to diverge in different parts of the world, but that there is enough in common in those ideas as they are expressed in architecture and in mythology, there's enough in common to deduce from that that, we're, that they all shared a common origin, that if we go back far enough, we're going to find the origin of this. And that's why I suggest that what we're looking at in these sites is a project of the survivors of the civilization that was destroyed, who deliberately attempted to recreate civilization in multiple different locations around the world. And, and certainly in the Andes, certainly in Egypt, certainly in Turkey, it looks like in Mexico uh, as, as well. And of course, the, the subsequent civilizations had their own story and they began to evolve in their own way and they diverged from each other in different ways as they did so. But that, that feeling of a shared common origin is still very strong in them. Well, the, the, there are 2,000 flood myths around the world. Noah's Ark is one of them. Um, the archaeological story at the moment is these are just memories of some local river floods, even though almost all of them describe a universal global flood. Um, it, it so happens that we have an episode when things like that did happen. Uh, and that's right at the beginning and right at the end of the Younger Dryas. You have this catastrophic flooding. I, I think the myths are memories of that, which have been passed down all around the world. Yeah. Well, the cenotes were the product of that 65 million year ago impact. They were created by that. Yeah. No, no. They're, they're, they're actually part of the fingerprint of the KT impact. The underwater pyramid in the Azores. Look, that's, that, all that is is a side scan sonar reading of, of something that looks regular in form. The Portuguese Navy denies it. They say it's a, it's a sea mount. But that is based on work they did in that area before this latest size scan sonar survey. I think it's interesting what's there. Um, it's, it's a project I, I do intend to, to follow up. I've been discussing this with Randall Carlson. The, the Azores stands on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, when you have an ice cap pressing down on North America, as it did for a very long time, it's pushing down the continental landmass of North America, likely raising up the North Atlantic Ridge. This is, this is what happens. It's called isostasy. And uh, it's possible that the lifting of the ice caps off North America resulted in a collapse of the North Atlantic Ridge. And that may explain why there are structures underwater there. After all, that's where Plato put Atlantis in the, in the Atlantic. I, I think it's more complicated than that, but I, I think we're looking at a civilization that was distributed uh, quite widely around the world, not only, uh, not only in the Atlantic. Yes? Is there an explanation for why they forgot, why we have to start over effectively as babies, begin again like children with no memory of what went before? Well, look at it this way. Let's consider if something like the Younger Dryas impacts happened today which they could do, by the way. We, we, we absolutely have the technology to prevent it today. But right now, we're focused on fear and hatred and suspicion. We're investing the big bucks in the, in the military. We're, we're willing to spend just billions of dollars on massive weapons of destruction. Um, and we're spending very little about the cost of what running one McDonald's every year on actually looking out for dangerous objects in our cosmic environment. And that's just plain stupid uh, because we could do something about it. The, the, this is not something I've gone into it 
t tonight, but the torrid meteor stream is full of large objects, and we should be paying much more attention to it, not with an attitude of gloom and doom and destruction, but with an attitude of let's solve this problem and make sure we don't become the next lost civilization. So, to address your point, if such a disaster occurred today, I think our civilization would go down. I think it would go down very, very fast. Ours is an incredibly powerful civilization. It's very technologically adept, but very few people in this civilization know how to survive. Uh, we depend on the specialisms of others. There's an intricate network of specialisms that make for the strength and for the weakness of our society. And that intricate network could be picked apart very rapidly by a, gr a global cataclysm. My understanding is that there is only food for three days in any of our major cities. You break down that food supply into the cities and you're into a walking dead scenario within about a week, you know. Um, Really, it's, it, 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 there's very little chance that our civilization would survive. If all those, if all those links break down, where are our, our archives? Largely stored on software these days or on, or on paper. Will, the, will the, the, the computer programs to read that software be available 10 or 12,000 years from now? I don't think so. Um, who will survive will be the hunter-gatherers, the meek of the earth, people in the Amazon rainforest, people in the Kalahari Desert, because they know how to survive. They're masters of survival. Such a disaster would actually go over the top of their heads. They wouldn't even notice it that much. And maybe some of us would you know, settle down amongst them and, and, and depend on them for our, for our nurturing and our, and our future. Uh, and 10,000 years from now, all that would be passed down is a, is a memory of a once great civilization that had almost magical powers, but could not wear its prosperity with moderation and was slapped down by the universe and forgot everything about itself. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Well, see, thing is, I'm not talking about a new comet. I'm talking about the torrid meteor stream. That comet that entered the solar system 20,000 years ago, that broke up into fragments, some of the fragments hit the Earth 12,800 years ago, some more we think hit the Earth 11,600 years ago. We know that one hit the Earth as recently as 1908. There's a lot of large fragments up there. The calculations indicate more than 100 asteroids of a kilometer in diameter in the torrid meteor stream, all remnants of the original giant comet. Um, and and um, possibly one object that may be as much as 20 miles in diameter, fully dark. When, when comets don't outgas, they extrude tars, which completely cover them, and they become very difficult to see. So it's a known threat, and we pass through it twice a year. I liken it to you know, strapping on a blindfold and crossing a six-lane interstate twice a year and just hoping we don't meet any traffic. You know, or if we do, that it would be motorcycles rather than trucks. That's, that, that's the, kind of, the kind of situation. And the, the calculations indicate that we, minute variations in the Earth's orbit will bring us into more dangerous passages of the torrid meteor stream in the next 40 years. And we can absolutely do something about it. It's just a matter of money and of choice. And we're not making that choice right now. What would the solution look like? To get it out of the way, what you don't really want to do is blow it up with a nuclear bomb because then you get you know, lots of buckshot instead of one large bullet and the buckshot may be even more dangerous. What you want to do is, is nudge it slightly and, and technologies have been developed to do this. To just, just a very slight nudge in the orbit of one of these objects will put it into a safe place. Uh, you can change their albedo. Uh, you can paint one side of the object uh, so that the sun's rays affect it differentially from the other side. That will push it out of the way. You can attach sails to it that react to the solar wind. There's all sorts of, of technologies have been developed. It's just that nobody's taking them to the next stage and actually delivering them. Okay, I'll take three more questions. Yes? It beats me, actually. I, I, think we're dealing, I think we're dealing with a technology that's so different from our own that we don't see it and we don't understand it. I do you know, hear what some of the ancient texts say and they talk about sound being used to move these objects, somehow changing their state and making them malleable. Um, I, I think we should, we should look into that. We've gone down the path of mechanical advantage in our society. I think ancient civilizations may have used different routes to manipulate matter and that's why we're finding it hard to understand how they did it. The gentleman behind you, yeah? I, I don't have investors. 
I don't get grants. I don't get any funding from anybody. Uh, the readers of my books fund my expeditions. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's